Um, so we can sort of roll into our official event, which is our Kids Comics Book Launch for August. And we have with us today, Shauna Grant and Daniel McCloskey. Um, so da Daniel, I see you on my, there's a lot of Zoom screens here and I had to look for you and now I see you where you are. Um, so Shauna is here to talk to us about um, Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe, which just came out from Scholastic. And Daniel is here to, oh, thank you, yes. And Daniel is here to talk to us about his graphic novel, Cloud Town, that came out from Abrams a few months ago. Yay! Um, Shauna, did you hold up your book? I wasn't sure if you did or not. Yay! Okay. Um, so the way, you know, you guys have, many, most of you have been to these interviews before. We're very casual here. I do have questions that I sort of get the conversation going with and we'll talk, we'll see how long my questions last, but I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end for everybody here to ask your own questions. So as we're talking, you know, if you, a question pops into your head and you want to put it in the chat, just put it in the chat. Or if you want to wait and raise your hand um, once we get to the question and answer period, that's fine too. Um, so I guess the way I'm going to start this off is we're going to start by focusing on the book, but then I'm going to quickly pull back and I want to talk a lot about career and, you know, like advice, behind the scenes advice. So Shauna, maybe we could start with you. Could you just kind of Introduce to us what is Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe? What's the story behind it? Um, who's the audience? Why did you yeah. make it? that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, okay. So hi everybody, I'm Shauna J. Grant and Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe is an early readers graphic novel. So it's perfect for kids aged six to eight as like their first time like reading independently and getting into comics. And it's about a little girl named Mimi who wants to prove that she's more than just cute because she's feeling like a little bit um, pushed aside because everyone is like, oh, you're too cute to get dirty or you're too cute to like help with this stuff. And so she goes with the help of her um, magical talking toy dog, Penelope. Um, she tries out a lot of different outfits and personas to find something to show people like, see, like I'm more than just cute. And it's a story about being true to yourself. So Shauna, I have to say that one of the things I love about your storytelling is your, you feel, it feels to me like you have a really intuitive understanding of little kids <laughs> and that, that, you know, how little kids, they hate being called cute because they want to be grown up. They don't want to be cute. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do you, did it kind of surprise you that, well, I, I am sort of getting into the the whole process part of it, but this whole book came about because Scholastic came to you and specifically asked you if you would be interested in creating a book for their early graphics line. So when they came to you, had you ever contemplated writing for very, very young children? Because up until that point, you hadn't been doing for that age. Yeah, I haven't thought about it at all. Um, and I've been drawing comics for like a while. I had a web comic called Princess Love Pond. And um, I've done like a lot of short comics for anthologies and stuff. So I always had like in mind that I was making stories for like me when I was 14 years old. But um, I've always had like a really cute art style and I never really drew like stories that were like too adult. Like I liked handling like concepts about like love and emotions, but telling them in a way that like all audiences could enjoy so I was used to having like little kids read my comics and still get a lot out of it but it's a lot different like specifically making it you know like for little kids like for little like first graders and you know keeping in mind like what are they going to be able to like understand and how can I write stuff so that they can like get everything out of it yeah I think well a little bit later, maybe we'll talk about the back and forth that has mm -hmm. happened with you and your editors. I think that would be super interesting. Um, but so, Daniel, I want you to get the chance now to introduce Cloud Town and tell us a little bit more about your book. Uh, yeah, Cloud Town is for a little older readers than Mimi uh, and kind of like the 
the audience that uh, Shauna was saying she was writing for originally, which is younger than I was writing for originally. Um, so I'm I'm aiming at like nine to 14. So she was saying 14, kind of like um, this book is aimed at the age group of like the cool kids in Mimi, where they're like <laughs> a little more serious, but like start playing randomly. Also, they're like when you're still wiggly, but also feelings are real big. It's about two best friends that have to go to a new high school because their old high school was smashed by a giant monster. Um, that happens before the book even starts. Uh, like the the opening like title page is a smash school and like candles by Cloudtown High. And it's kind of ends up being like about that journey going to a new school and, you know, small spoilers, continue to be big monster monsters, and one of them gets to be in the giant robot. <laughs> I, I did um, read one of the reviews of Cloudtown that said it is weirdly and unexpectedly wonderful, so. Yes, <laughs> that, that it's literally as weird as the editors would let me. Like, I, I, <laughs> I kept on getting things cut out, and I'd be like, if it's not weird, what's the point? She'd be like, <laughs> Daniel, it's still weird. Don't worry. <laughs> So did, is this a project that you developed on your own and then shopped around to different publishers? Yeah, so in, I've done a lot of self-publishing. Um, I actually, I have a little comic I did about like the journey to getting this book done. It's like free on my website and on Amazon if you guys want to check it out called Failing to Quit. Um, but in this particular case, it was one of a stack of ideas I had. And when I finally got an agent, um, part of what attracted him to me is um, I had a bunch of stuff for him to learn with because he was new to being an agent on his own. And so uh, of the stuff I had, we pitched a few things first. And then he was like, of the things you've already started, this is the thing that I think would make most sense. And I was like, well, let me redo it based on the feedback I had gotten from like the last couple rejections because mm -hmm. I pitched like a book a year for a couple of years. And um and yeah, and that's that's how this book started. Okay, so um, maybe it would be interesting to hear from both of you, Shauna and Daniel, about the what I alluded to earlier, which is sort of the back and forth. So, can you t talk a little bit about um, the? I'd be interested to hear how the book developed from what you originally pitched to the publisher to what ultimately came out and was published. Shauna, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so like with Mimi, um, yeah, I actually started developing Mimi to be like a board book, like a little picture book. And um, that's how it came across Scholastic. And they were like, can you make this into a, like a full comic? And I was like, okay, yeah. So um, developing Mimi like definitely felt like from the ground up. And my editors were like just really super involved. And um, so it was a lot of putting like what I wanted to do, which was like a magical girl story for like little kids. And also like getting feedback on like what they believe like is great for like early readers and just, you know, like, like adding more little kids to the story for Mimi to interact with and um, just, trying to like adjust like the story to be like well like kids in this age group would probably you know think like this or act like that and just like really um pumping up like how like fun and spunky Mimi is but um yeah there was like a lot of back and forth throughout but they were always just very like you know um just do what you do best <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of had the opposite direction oh, where I pitched me. this I as like, here. oh, uh, I feel like somebody needs to be muted. I don't know what that noise was. Uh, hold on. We need to figure out. Um, there's some background noise somewhere. I can talk with background noise. Okay. Um, I'm not worried. I just didn't want to be interrupting someone that had to talk. Um <laughs> Yeah, so I went the opposite direction where I pitched this as basically three 300 page graphic novels. And they were like, well, could you do it one 200 page graphic novel? And I was like, okay, yeah, let's figure this out. So um, 
it ended up actually in order to do that to tell a smaller story you end up in, in the way I did it anyways you break off a part of like a really small part maybe a third of one of those books and you insert like a a framework to build it and make it work as a story um in the case of this book I also I pitched it uh in a way where I could self-publish it as someone that's always been self-publishing I've always had like this kind of two-track mindset where I'm moving toward a goal I am willing to take extra time and extra effort to court people that can help me get to that goal, but I need the base level, the art I'm making to be unstoppable, basically. So um, I started it as a zine. I did, I had like a Patreon supported system where I do, every time I did a zine, I'd charge them and I'd send them out and that would pay for like the 200 copies or whatnot. So I had done a couple, I'd done two different versions of this story at that point, right? Because my agent was like, let's pitch this. And I was like, well, let me do it again because I've learned a lot. And um, and I sent that in and it got to a new editor's desk, like basically the first week she was in the office and she liked it, but then she had to convince everybody else. And um, this is in my little free comic on the website, but um my agent caught back and was like, yeah, she's interested. She just wants uh, finished art. And I thought the art was finished. Um, so I just was like, okay, what's what's finished look like? He said, I asked her that. And she said, smooth lines. And I was like, great, coming right up. And I just like redrew as many pages as I could without sleeping for a couple of days. And um, uh, they liked it. So, yeah. Daniel, I think you're keeping it real. I think, yeah. <laughs> I've gotten better. It's been a, 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 an intense, it was an intense experience, but um, like it, the editorial back and forth for me, like one of the things that's been really valuable about it is not necessarily, it's hard to know whose ideas are like quote unquote better because it's all opinion, but mm -hmm. that kind of conflict for me has helped me like grow as a creator. Mm -hmm. So are there cases where you ended up what, are there cases where you initially balked at an editor's suggestion and then you incorporated it and then ultimately thought it did make it better and, and vice versa? Are there cases where you got suggestions that you just absolutely put your foot down and wouldn't do? Um, I was basically, once I was like, once I totally changed the story before even starting and redrew, I was pretty amicable to the idea of like, I've written a bunch of stuff on my own uh, and like, I am entering this particular interaction very much in like a learning mode. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, I'm, I entered this book deal in order to know how to do it. Um, so I was pretty flexible. There were things I put my foot down about, but those honestly in, in this particular situation, like ended up edited out later. Uh, so they, they got me in the end and it just ended up being more work for me there was like some pretty late edits that ended up causing me to like to uh, restructure the entire book after completion again, um, because, you know, someone's boss read it like a year late, stuff like that. So um, again, one thing I learned that is very important is when there's something that you're not hearing back about, and I've heard this from more and more graphic novelists when I'm like listening to podcasts, and I maybe heard it before, but it, it's, it didn't sound as important. It is important to be pleasant, but consistently emailing people so they get back to you about something that will take them a few minutes to respond to, but over the course of a few hundred pages might save you months of your life. So like those things are, are important <laughs> to consistently and pleasantly bug people about. Yeah. Very, very, very good advice. I just want to underline that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so I would love to back up a little bit and ask both of you about how or when, I, that, going back to what I said about watching that documentary and like having these tiny memories of myself as a tiny little kid, um, when did you decide you wanted to work in comics? Was it when you were a kid? Was it when you got older? Um, what did you think about 
what would happen when you got into comics when you first started? Shauna, maybe you could go first. Yeah, um, I've always really loved making art. I used to draw a lot when I was little. Um, I remember uh, one of my earliest memories is watching like Muppet Babies and they were making an animation. And so I was like, oh, I could do that. We have like a big old video recorder. Like I can draw a bunch of pages and record it and make a movie. Sure. Um, yeah, but I was like really inspired by like anime and manga. So um, by the time I was going into high school, I was pretty much like I want an art career, whether it was like graphic design or being like an illustrator. And so like in high school, I went to a lot of art programs. So I studied at like Cooper Union for the summers um, to work on my portfolio or like the Queen's Council of the Arts have portfolio programs. But um, one of my favorite programs that I went to was my last year of high school. I went to um, the Henry Market Martin Institute and there was an artist um, at the time called Liz Bailey who had a comic class and uh, they had also went to the School of Visual Arts, which is where I wanted to go to college, but I was like the only student there. So it was just like going every Friday and just talking comics and, you know, borrowing like their graphic novels and being like, hey, look at this comic of evil chickens that I'm working on. and. Um, I don't know, I just knew like, yeah, I'm gonna go to college and I'm gonna graduate with a book deal. It's gonna be like awesome. And um, it didn't quite work out like that at all, but eventually I did <laughs> manage to do what I wanted to do from when I was young. <laughs> oh, so gosh, Shauna, I don't know whether I should shift over to Daniel and ask you to tell your origin story or or whether to keep going and ask you like, well, what happened after college? So we'll come back to you, Shauna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, so why don't you tell us your origin story and then we'll talk about like, how did you actually get your first break? Yeah, I have. I, I'm starting to get questions for Shauna too. I I, I read, uh, you know, for everybody else, I read Mimi really recently, and I really I was impressed by like definitely the joy of like your creation. Like, there's definitely I can feel like you're talking about like loving to draw as a kid, and you can see that in the art, and it's it is delightful. Um, Thank you. Also, I want to hear more about your manga anime influences because I saw like the Sailor Moon drawings on your Instagram, and I'm. You know, a lot of people of our generation were really influenced by manga. Jap Japan's the Hollywood of comics right now. It just is. So um, my origin story, again, uh, is a little bit the opposite, um, but does involve Cooper Union, ironically. My big sister uh, is a very talented artist. She could do like basically photorealistic painting in college or in high school. And um, she applied to Cooper Union. And they were like, Meh, maybe, maybe you could get in. And she's like, well, I'm a sophomore. Uh, and they were like, okay, here's what you should work on. And they went through all of her books and sketches and was like, in a year, if you can get this good, come back. And she just like hustled and worked every day and did like basically like a rocky montage of art. And by the end, she just didn't want to ever draw again. <laughs> and she, she did go to Cooper Union and make cool art. And she continues to make cool art. But she very rarely draws and paints, although she's incredibly good at it. And like, I often learn things when I'm drawing near her. And she's just like, uh, no, no. She's like, your art gives me a headache. And she'll like, like, give me little bits of information that are just like, basic, uh, basic information for fine artists that I don't have because when my dad was like do you want to do all these art classes like your big sister and you know my dad is an illustration professor and a children's book author so um I was around that so I had a base level kind of artistic experience but not not in the in a serious way and um, I was like, no way, like, I do not want to do that. <laughs> that seems like a terrible idea. I'm going to be a writer because um, I want to be different and also special than my big sister. And um, unfortunately, I also was failing English classes basically my entire young life. And then that continued into college. And um, I did get a degree in writing and film studies, but uh, 
the story I was trying to write um, had screenplay format chunks in it that just weren't working and basically influenced by Japanese comics next to Japanese light novels, which are often like the same story, but more prose. I decided, well, I could do comics for this. So I drew the screenplay format of those pages of this novel called A Film About Billy. Um, it won the, it was nominated for the Drake Emerging Writers Award and um, it did not win. And it uh, was just a small press in Pittsburgh published it. Like a, a few hundred copies exist, um, but that was my first thing. And the 88 pages of comics I drew for that 288 page book um, were my first pages of real comics. And then they were really bad, so I drew them twice. So it's like 160 pages of comics to start. And then um, in Pittsburgh, I mean, this is a tangent, but I ended up writing a writer's co-op about of a big messed up house. that housed like 46 young writers and cartoonists over the course of six years. And um, the cartoonists just had a really strong community in Pittsburgh and were really encouraging. And um, I ended up just keeping going that way more than the prose writing. And you know, also um, when you spell words wrong in emails to editors uh, and you're a cartoonist, everyone's like, it's fine, he's a cartoonist. But if you're a novelist, everyone, people, people put the brakes on really quick. I don't, I don't get it, but uh, yeah, that's mine. There's, you're not the only writer who's, who's not good at spelling. So don't. I, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I'm really curious to hear from both of you about like how you officially broke into the industry. Can you kind of take us from your college years to like your efforts to uh, get your work out into the world, whether that's through self-publishing or through networking or pitching, like what, how, how long did it take and what did you try? What worked, what didn't work? Shauna, maybe you could start us off. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I went to the School of Visual Arts where I got my BFA in cartooning. And um, I feel like my whole college career was just me trying to relearn how to actually draw comics because I don't know I feel like my comics are like really bad I don't know maybe I'm overthinking it yeah but definitely like by the end I was like okay this art kind of sucks but oh the storytelling okay I guess I was onto something um but yeah I didn't end up graduating with like any book deals or anything but um every summer me and my college friends would go down to Baltimore for like Otacon and table and um it was horrendous at first because we had no idea what we were doing but we would go back every summer and get a little bit better so by the time we graduated it was like hey like we have no jobs why don't we just apply to a bunch of conventions and travel and so that's what I did for like seven years after college I was just you know making my rounds of shows I'd go out to like like Pittsburgh for for Teco which I absolutely miss and love um I'd go out to like Chicago I've been down to like Las Vegas and uh Boston and Atlanta and you know so that kept me drawing and also like it made money you know like every year I would make more money and get better and my, my art would keep improving and I think about like five years of doing that I was like okay this is like really cool and all but like I felt like I had to make a choice of this is either going to be like the rest of my life being like a professional like con artist and like really getting heavy into like the merchandise producing and all of that and honestly like I I, I get exhausted very easily like I just I don't I don't like doing a lot of stuff <laughs> it's too hard so I was like no I really just kind of want to be at home and draw books and not have to like lug 50 pound suitcases everywhere so I started a web comic called um uh, Princess Love Pond which is just like a really cute a magical girl story super super pink and it was basically me being like okay I need to draw comics because it's been years since school and I haven't really drawn comics but um and doing that um it actually got like really really popular it's like my first time doing like 
getting interviewed by people and just like being like oh wow like people like actually like really like my art that's like kind of cool and then from there since I had like comic examples it was a lot easier to apply to like different anthologies so um I did like a lot of stuff for like Dirty Diamonds which is like an all women um comics anthology um and I was I did uh one like about the uh, may I pet your werewolf which was like an LGP, uh, LGBT uh, werewolf anthology and you know I did stuff like that which led me to like you know just doing more things I've done covers for like for boom comics for like their adventure time series and you know and then tabling was like I got to meet actual like editors so I always really liked for a second so when I was at a convention in Harlem we called them um, the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Research Center um I met um an editor from first second and they were like wow you're like, your art's really cool like have you ever thought about doing like middle grade graphic novels and I was like no I have no idea what this middle grade thing is but I love graphic novels and I love you guys so I would do that um and thing is I'm really really shy so like I had her card she wanted my pitch for something and I just overthought it for like a year and then the next year she came again she's like hey I'm still waiting for your pet <laughs> I'm like oh <laughs> okay <laughs> and um around that time too um another editor at first second um reached out to me and were like hey like I've seen your comics um would you like to draw like this Rose of Parks graphic novel you want to test for it and I'm like yeah sure so that's like the first book I signed on for and then after that I signed on to do a memoir with um first second because you know memoirs and graphic novels are like really cool right now um, I had another editor I met that used to work at Line Forge who was also like, hey, I want a pitch from you. Like, where is it? It's been a year. You know, I did this twice. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> as I pitched like a third book, which um, luckily got dropped because the pay was not really, really great. So I'm holding out to that later. And then right before like COVID and everything happened, I met Jana at NMA NYC and she was starting her agency and she's like hey do you have an agent and I'm like no everyone's full and I don't like having to do all this stuff so I still don't have an agent I'm like help me <laughs> and so um that's how we got you know got to working together and that led me to doing stuff with Scholastic and yeah um, I like to say to people that um in my senior year of college, um, I took a class with um, Becky Coonan, you know, who was like the Marvel um, darling because like she was just amazing. She still is amazing. And she was like, yeah, school was like, whatever. I dropped out early. I wanted to do comics. And it took me like, I think she said maybe like nine years before she actually broke in. And it was like pretty much like that, you know, um, it was either nine years or until she was like 29 but pretty much like when I was like around 29 that's when I was finally like getting actual book deals and I was like oh my god like she was right <laughs> <laughs> wow okay um I I really want to come back and ask you about the princess love pond webcomic because I think that there's a bunch of people here probably that would like to hear a little bit more about that but first well let's um hear from you Daniel about like what's your how did you finally break in well, I have a lot of stories about that, but honestly, most of them aren't really helpful. And since most most of the people here are professional or aspiring professionals, or both, as I, I think mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a line that you can ride for a while. I think that's where I am, both both professional and aspiring at the same time. Uh, I I just kind of wanted to underline something that that Shauna said that I think is really helpful. Like since my book has come out, or at least since I handed in the final art. One of the other jobs I did was working at a local comic shop. Um, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area right now. I'm in Oakland. And Mission Comics, great comic shop. I love the spot. Um, and working at a comic shop is a really good thing to do. I'm just saying it's thousands of great comics come out every single month. And like when you are someone that has spent years, 10 years, nine years, whatever, trying to break in and you have... Um, it's easy to put the weight of the effort you've put to the value of this thing. But the truth is like your success is not 
measured by how hard you worked or like even how talented you are like your success is based on your ability to delight other people and um I think something that uh like if it was intentional or not like Shauna was just talking about is she was delighting other people she was going to these cons people were people that like to spend money on things were seeing her things and getting excited she made a web comic that people liked to the point where people kept coming up to her and asking her for things uh again I think that we've had a pretty mirrored experience where I was kind of doing the opposite I was like making stuff and pushing it out trying to get that attention and like a film about Billy my first book which I did do the small press thing and it, it was a good home for it and we every once in a while it still is a really important book to somebody because it's about a pretty heavy you know experience for me which makes sense but like I was I I submitted that to every uh you know agent that took comics that I could find in 2008 right uh through like looking at magazines and college libraries I had a traveling poster selling job and when I was like on like coffee break I would go to the library at the college I was selling posters for because they had all like the writer's digest magazines and I'd go through the agent lists and then I'd email them. And if it said in eight months, you can email me again. I'd put a, like a, a Google calendar alert and I'd email them in eight months at like 7 a.m. on a Wednesday. Cause maybe that would actually 7 a.m. on a Wednesday is not a bad piece of advice. <laughs> it's like, it's good to not be Monday, not be Friday and be the first email they see when they get there. I did get one response, but no, nothing. Um, the people, again, I ran a writer's co-op I've I've known a lot of people that have gotten agents over the years in different ways. If you listen to any of their stories, the way they got those agents like is unrepeatable. Um, but they all have something in common, which is that they made good work consistently and put it out there. And then eventually someone notices, you know, um, Sometimes it's coincidence. Sometimes someone's at a writer's residency. Sometimes they win a little award and that's enough to get an email or, you know, sometimes there's someone going around at a convention looking for talented folks. So uh, the, the more time I spend at the comic shop, the more um, I'm both daunted by the amount of talent out there, but also um, pleased to see that the people that are really talented do rise you know compared to everyone else you know um so as someone that sees their own growth pretty consistently as someone that didn't take drawing seriously until they were you know uh already out of college um I have this kind of back and forth like I have to acknowledge what I need to do to grow in order to to do that growing and and what it takes to delight other people is multifaceted they need to be have access to the book like distribution finding out about it all those things matter but like yeah i think the idea of like just just making something good and putting it out there i think that's where i'm, I'm going to stop this rant <laughs> All right, so I am soon going to be turning the floor over to everybody here for um, any questions that you might have. But before I do that, I have one big other question that I want to ask both of you about, which is your creative process. So I don't know if either of you is open to sharing a screen or if you just want to talk about it, but um, I would just love to hear, can you describe anything that you think is relevant to everybody here who... I'm sure everybody here loves seeing other creators process because everybody has a different way that they go about things. And it's just so inspiring to, to hear. Sean, I think, are you talking? I wasn't sure. Uh, yeah, no, I was like, oh my gosh, uh, what, how smart it would have been to like have a screen ready. But um, yeah, I feel like personally, I'm constantly like, adjusting my creative process like um when I worked on my web comic I just kind of went with the flow it would be like I'll start writing a script for my chapter I'll quit halfway through because I hate writing scripts 
and then it'll just be like thumbnails to like okay this is the page I'm working on today so I'll thumbnail it and go and um that's kind of like what I did with my first graphic novel with the first second I kind of like did it page by page but then with Mimi um since Scholastic um I feel like Scholastic and first second are like so different first second is very like yeah it's cool like <laughs> and scholastic is like okay we like need this by here um so I kind of had to have my whole story like out especially since I was like pitching it so I really needed my outline of the story to be like super tight luckily since Mimi is so short I didn't have to write a script so that was really really great so um my process for doing uh, Mimi is I'll write a full outline that goes over like I'll split it up into like five chapters and I'll just like write the summary for the chapter like this is what everything that happens and I'll do that for like the whole story and then once all of that is like okayed and approved with my editors I'll thumbnail it out which is just like little scribbled pages of this is where my characters are and that's where I actually start to like write the dialogue and so that'll just I just kind of like write it off the fly like okay this is what's gonna to happen how should it like made me talk or like you know like I don't know I always found like writing dialogue came like really easy especially if I got to like just you know draw it in instead of like okay so let's see like Mimi's gonna say this on this page in this panel um and then once I have my thumbnails approved I get to move on to pencils and I'll like make the art like nice and clear and pretty um, and then once that is approved with my editors, I get to ink and then once and do the lettering as well. Um, and then after that, once that's approved, I get to do like the coloring. And then once that's done, I get to go back and fix everything that they missed earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but once all that is done, um, you know, I get to like hand it off to my publisher and I don't really have to do like anything else, like worry about like, oh, what printer am I going to take it to? Like, it's just it's very nice and easy. <laughs> Shauna, I bet a, a lot of people here would love to hear details about what software you use and hardware and like, can you give, do you do everything in a certain program or do you mix and match? Yeah, um, right now I do like all my drawing and coloring and clip studio. Um, but for my lettering, I do in Photoshop because Clip Studio and Photoshop are not friends when it comes to lettering. And um, my editors, like they need to be able to like edit the text and whatever if they have to. So um, I pretty much just kind of, I think for like my second book, I just like, lettered and inked everything and then I kind of like after I color it I'll just like open like an uncolored page and a color page and just copy and paste like the color layer back to like the text pages so that everything it stays like nice and you know the text isn't rasterized and stuff so you do the whole thing soup to nuts digitally is that right yes everything is digital mm -hmm. okay Daniel um sorry what what's the question <laughs> I was just listening <laughs> so the question is what is your process can you kind of talk us through like how, right. how you get from the very beginning of the story idea to the finished product yeah um so that changes a lot um depending on all sorts of stuff I um I was, so I was traveling the country living in a van when I sold this book. And um, I had been doing this, this free monthly newspaper comic in Pittsburgh called Free Money, where I wrote, drew, carried 4,000 copies in a backpack and put them in pizza shops and coffee shops everywhere for, for free had ads, you know. And, um, and for that, I was using watercolor and, and ink brushes and stuff. Um, but uh, when me and my partner were traveling the country, we, you know, we had jobs because we needed to pay for gas and stuff. So um, she had a remote job before all jobs were remote. And we would do like drive a few hours in the direction we were aiming 
and then stop at a Starbucks usually, and then drive a few more hours. Cause you know, there were just Starbucks literally everywhere in America and they all had the internet. Sometimes we'd work in a Taco Bell. That was funny. Um, but at some point of just the cleaning up and setting up uh, the ink and board and like I had a LED light bulb I put under a piece of plexiglass in like a drawer in the van, uh, just took a lot of time uh, day by day. And uh, iPads were like 800 bucks. And that seemed like so much money to me then, but I bought it and uh, I did basically the whole, um, this whole graphic novel on Procreate plus uh, Photoshop, which I didn't have or know anything about. I'd never used. And they were like, oh yeah, can you do all this stuff? And I was like, what is that? Like, like it took months to even like learn how, like learn the basics of Photoshop. It was like a sec another job. And I was like, I, okay, all right, fine. I'll do whatever. But um, as far as the creative process goes, I, um, again, this project was totally different. It was like, I, I was, I was like, Let's figure out how to do what what do you want? You want a script? They want a script. I wrote a script. Um, I also I'm learning a lot about how to interact with edits from uh, screenwriting podcasts now because like I'm realizing that I've written a lot of prose stories and I think about story a lot. Um, the way I function and and a lot of my creative process is in that mode. And so when like anything is changed in the story, there's ripple effects that affect the entire story. So if you're like, oh, I want, I want, you know, I don't, I think she should say no, <laughs> like in this sentence, like that, that means that like the next argument doesn't have an emotional pace that makes sense. And then that means if that argument doesn't happen, like the conclusion's different. And then like, this thing that set up that like argument that would have happened earlier doesn't make sense. So I'm like, all of a sudden the whole book is like rip, like, you know, it's, uh, it's changing quicker than, than the person like might expect if they were like, no, I just wanted that sentence different. I was like, but that sentence affects everything. So the way I'm, I'm trying to think about things moving forward, um, is more holistically, but also trying to keep that like spontaneity and joy. So what I am doing this time around, um, is I am outlining the next story idea. I am doing that pretty loosely, but you have to make yourself cry, or at least that's my rule. If I can't make myself cry when I outline it, then it, no one else is gonna care at all because I am easy to make cry at a story. Um, so then if I get that, I'm like, this is good. Then I, uh, in this case, I um, pitched a lot simpler, you know, that I, I did a pitch for this next book. There was just some sketches of characters, the basic A, B, and C plot, because I was finding when I pitched graphic novels, the, the plot could feel convoluted to someone that wasn't reading it already. But if I separate the A, B, and C plot, um, it's more comfortable for people that uh, don't, don't have a brain that's mixed up. Um, and so after that, I've gotten a little bit of time to marinate on it. And then from that loose outline, I just draw an insanely rough comic. So like, I mean, last month, or I don't know how long it took me, I drew, you know, a 224 page comic that like, like, I, you know, I got to look at it again soon or else I'm not sure I'll be able to read it. It's like, there might be a page that just has a sentence on it, like typed instead of drawn. If I'm like, eh, eh, later, you know, it's, it's a first draft in the truest sense of the word. It is like a sketch, like in, in Japan, again, they call them nemu. Like even, um, even if you're just a writer of comics in Japan, it's pretty traditional for you to do a rough, like stick figure-ish version of the comic. And I am enjoying that because I found when I wrote a script um, so much is page based and pace based that uh, it's hard to know how much space things take up like for me a lot of the really delightful details in a comic are like a silly joke but a silly joke can take like four pages like if like there's an example right now where I'm thinking of having I don't know if it's going to happen but I'm thinking of having these two teenage girls that were going to ride on a bike together be on one of those single wheel things 
And like, in order to do that, it's going to take a little bit of slapstick and then being on one side of the wheel, each holding hands and like bending, like, and in order to just have them figure that out, that's like several pages of story, you know? Um, and so if I hadn't figured out some of the gags and, and little, little jokes and tricks, um, I'd end up having like 12 panels on a page, which, you know, I, I'm willing to do sometimes, but, uh, uh, also then moving forward, as far as, um, how I'm doing art, it varies. Like I'm willing to combine photos. I'm willing to do whatever, but I'm not doing it purely digital anymore, just because for me, uh, that was taking more time because, um, I'm not really great with the endless ability to undo things. I just get into like a pit of redrawing something that it's not actually necessarily getting better at a certain point. So now what I'm starting to do is a tight rough, you know, but you know, not smooth lines, you know, <laughs> and then I print it out and I light box it and I use ink. And then if it's, I mess up bad enough to white it out, I white it out. And if I didn't mess up enough to white it out, I move on to the next page. And that is good for my wrist. So Daniel, I'm glad you started mentioning that you have another project that you're working on right now. Is this is this something that um, you're going to be pitching, or it's already under contract? Uh, it. I'm working. I have a couple of things. I have one thing I will be pitching. I had. Uh, I'm. I wrote a pitch for it. Um, but then I. I honestly, I hired an editor to look at it. Just um, a friend of a friend, and at an early stage before I was too connected to any of the, the concepts. And I found that really valuable. Um, he was, he's someone that works at uh, bigger graphic novel publishers. And he was able to just be like, these are the things I like. These are the things that I thought were like, whatever. And these are the things that are just going to make it a little less easy for the editor to sell to their people, you know, um, you know, stick with the ones you want to, but that's that's his opinion and I found that useful um so I have that kind of one version completed but I'm going to redo it and change it to make it a little more a little more middle grade honestly and um <clears throat> and then I have another one where I've just like I've just I'm pitching a sequel to Cloud Town and you know we'll see if they want it or not but if not I own the rights so I theoretically could do it myself so I don't know um I also, just because it's, I don't know, the nature of the business right now, there was like a little bit of a need for me to do a story Bible for like potential TV stuff, which is like, you know, interesting to do. It's like a non-zero chance of someone looking at it. So I'm trying to use it. I used to write artist grants when I, I worked at the, at the uh, co-op that I ran in Pittsburgh. And I found when I was starting writing grants I didn't get any of them and I was trying to write what I thought people wanted and then I continue to write grants and they're so time consuming for me to write that I just decided I'm going to write this in a way that it will be helpful to me even if I don't get it at least I'm planning this idea for myself and so in doing like this story pitch bible for like a potential tv thing like I'm I'm mostly using it as a way to like like think about my plans for my story for myself and like presenting it in the way that I think is super awesome and that like any reasonable person would think is super awesome <laughs> but like but doing it in a way that's valuable to me like no matter what like I'm gonna have this packet that explains explains to my future self why this is important to do and why I like it and um thinking of like the bigger story holistically um again, talking about manga, it's like, I love like 3000 page comics. Like I love, like bless those, those creative teams, you know, but like, I, I like a lot of story at once. And so um, I'm, that's why I pitched three 300 page books. I just want more all the time. And so uh, I kind of want more from me too. That's very inspiring. <laughs> Shauna, can you talk a little bit about what you have coming up in the future? 
Um, right now, I have Mimi book two coming out in February, as well as my history comics, Rosa Parks and Claudette Colvin graphic novel coming out this January. And um, I'm working on my middle grade graphic memoir. Um, and I'm trying to pitch two more Mimi books as well. Yes, yeah, so you have a lot, a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. You are busy, busy human. <laughs> I know. I yeah. I feel like you said, Shauna, at one point that you're you're lazy or something like that, and you it are not. It feels lazy. hard because like I'm still kind of like in the writing stage of my memoirs, and I'm like, oh man, maybe I could have taken more like books on right now and stuff. <laughs> uh, all right. So, does anybody here have a question that you want to jump in and ask Shauna or Daniel or both? Young? Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, this one's for Shauna. Uh, by the way, I got your book, so I like it a lot. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, I want to say, like, um, so when, when you're, like, go, making, like, your graphic novel uh, for the first time, like, uh, did you do like a lot of research, like looking at other graphic novels, or did you feel that you should stay true to the way you make comics yourself since then? And I'm just wondering how you made that transition from like your own kind of comics to like the graphic novel side of things. Um, I don't feel like the way I drew comics changed too much. Um, even though like I was like really inspired by like manga growing up, I feel like going to college and the kind of teachers that I took classes with, they like they teach comics. They like they make textbooks for like how to make comics. So I feel like my style of doing comics is very like, I don't know, um, is not so like like it's pretty typical like how you would see in other graphic novels so um I didn't really change too much after that like I set up my pages the same way I did with um with my web comic and um yeah I still like I read comics that I like like I need to read more comics but um I only so many hours in a day but um yeah I just I just draw what I like and I gravitate to looking at stuff that I really like the colors of or I really like how they do comics like I adore like um Jen Wings um how she does um storytelling with her graphic novels and stuff but, yeah I hope that helps yeah thank you uh, Daniel, actually, I'd love it if you could answer that question as well. Like, do you read comp titles um, or do you just ignore what's going on in the market and do your own thing? Um, kind of a combination of things now. Um, again, since working at the comic shop, I've read like several thousand extra comics because uh, it's like part of the job, you know, um, in sometimes in a way where I have like a stack of comics and I'm reading like several at once and I don't always know exactly what's going on uh, but yeah there's an, an amazing amount of great books um, I find it like interesting uh, that there's a bizarre like separation in the comics creation thing there, there's a lot of really inventive like like mm, like fundamental changes in how people are creating story in adult genre middle grade and kids books and they they don't always read each other's work, it feels like. Like, I feel like the, the dog man flip a is like where you flip back and forth and make a little animation is a really super active, fun thing that could be in adult books in certain moments. Um, there's been a lot of interesting stuff with like the Star Wars comics and then the, um, something is killing the children where like they do a double page spread for the title and it's like a very impactful thing um, that, that, that I think is changing comics. Uh, so I look at all this stuff um, in ways that get jumbled up that will be original to what I'm doing. However, if there's something someone hears what I'm doing, it's like, oh, you should read this. It's just like that. I will wait. <laughs> I'm like, I will read that in four years when I'm done with this because I don't care. Like, I don't want to like if it's great, either I will be like, oh, I don't need to make this book because it already exists 
or I'll be like, oh, I need to change this book. Or I'll be like, uh, like I'll be either be bummed that like, I want a bad example. Like if I'm already making it, show me an awful version. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to be better than this thing. I'm going to provide something for people that want, you know, X or, or something. Um, but I, I do think reading comics is a, a lovely way to, way to learn. And also just to think about like, you know, some comics should be boring, but aren't. I always, like, uh, um, I can't exactly recommend the manga series Bakuman um, because it's it's kind of really sexist, which sucks, uh, but it also is about uh, two cartoonist kids want, like, it's like a battle manga about Japanese kids wanting to be cartoonists. So it also has some kind of insights on the Japanese, uh, like, studio system kind of thing, which is really interesting. But it should be super on dynamic because it's kids drawing all day. Uh, it's by the creators of Death Note, which in some ways also should be undramatic because it's a lot of people writing down names. Um, <laughs> but when people successfully make those things dramatic, it's worth paying attention to. It's like, why am I so invested? Um, or even like, why am I bored? Like, I read all of Naruto on my phone this year. It is thousands of pages of comics. It is, I do not recommend starting it necessarily, although I had a great time. I would recommend reading the comic artist's uh, comments in the back of pages. Like, bless him, he's one of the few creators that actually thanks his assistants regularly. Um, but I get super bored when the battles go on too long. And I realized, like, I only actually care about, like, the two main characters' friendship. And like the battles add like intensity and flavor to those things. But uh, it's important to remember that like relationships are important. Like all these things just, just are reinformed by, by reading comics. Uh, when I first wrote my first big thing, my first like 90 page screenplay, which no one will ever see, I, I watched Life Aquatic like every single night with no volume on over and over and over again, just to be like, and my, my, screenplay had nothing to do with anything to do with life aquatic but I was like I like this story it has these interesting beats and it's it's constructed in a way that like it's again it's like confusing why it's so riveting you know to me and so like uh just kind of um absorbing that rhythm and trying to figure out how that applies to your story beats is really helpful um I also wanted to remember to say yeah Local comic shops are a really great place to go, uh, not just because they're important um, to get new readers, but they're also super important for new creators because, you know, Amazon's a great place for finding things easily and quickly, but um, I, I get ads from Amazon and they're, they're all dog, man. Like, I like dog, man. I do. But like, I, if you want to see something new, the only people that are out there reading new weird works and putting in the hands of people are those the middle class of of retailers which are small comic shops and they're the people that give a chance to the middle class of comic book creators too so that's one thing and I also had a note here totally unrelated the author's guild if you write and draw your own comics you can be a member of the author's guild their lawyer will look over your contract and give you notes so in the context of my contract it was like 27 pages and uh, my notes from the Authors Guild were seven pages. And they basically tell you every best carry scenario. Like they really want authors to win. So like they're, you know, if you come up to your agent with like this laundry list, your agent might get a little alarmed. But if you look through this and now you understand your contract better and you can pick one or two things that you're like, actually, I kind of want to fight for this. Like that can be important. And the more cartoonists involved in the Authors Guild, the more attention the Guild can pay to cartoonist issues. So just throwing that out there. Thank you, Daniel. I think that was really, I'm glad you consulted your notes and remembered to say that. <laughs> Um, Leo, oh, we probably have to wrap it up pretty soon. So I think Leo, um, unless Shauna and Daniel, are you willing to stay for like two more questions or should we wrap it up after Leo's question? I could stay a little longer. 
Okay. So if, if there's anybody here who has a question where you're like, I, I really want to make sure I can ask this. So raise your hand after Leo. Okay. Leo. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, Shauna, this has uh, been so great. We met briefly at Anime New York and it's so great to hear your background story. Um, it was at uh, uh, Jana's uh, uh, meet and greet. Dan, so awesome to hear your story. I adore your father. Um, I've known him for years. Um, he introduced me to my first agent, uh, Ed Maxwell, who I think we share some of that. Um, and you guys are both brilliant. Um, I, I love this. Um, most of my questions were answered, but there is a question that I have has been burning me uh, recently. And I think because you guys are so honest and and thoughtful, uh, I'll pose it to you. What do you think about this new uh, AI mid journey and and what that's uh, doing to image creators? Um, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, my first thought was like, okay, so when is Judgment Day happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't looked too much into it. Like it's kind of cool, um, but also like a little like the art's kind of creepy too. But um, I don't know. Like I still don't feel like like human art can be like replaced either way. So I, I don't. <laughs> I can, okay, I, I have enough. some I have some AI generated art I could show you actually. <laughs> Uh, my big sister does tech stuff. She does teaches intro to video game design. So I definitely, um, I am curious about it. It is an interesting thing. Um, it's not as good as Googling and cutting and pasting stuff or drawing at this point. I do think that, so my day job right now is I pedicab. I bike a 300 pound tricycle with tourists on it. And I, I argue about how much money they'll pay me to, to bike them around San Francisco and Barbadero. This job, every time anyone is on it, they say, uh, when are you going to get a motor on this thing? And I say, that's my job. But also there are bird scooters around me. There are Ubers. Uh, and yet, for some reason, people are still doing this thing. Um, I have had people on the back of that cab that are cartographers and they're like, are you worried about being replaced by a bird scooter? I was like, how do you feel about satellite imagery? Like, you know, this is this is the world we live in. We live in, you know, my co-op, my writer's co-op was called the cyberpunk apocalypse. And cyberpunk means high tech and low life. And apocalypse means to reveal. And it's just, it's what we live in. Like open any, any comic right now, um, you know, all the, well, especially Japanese comics, you'll see a lot of 3D models dropped in the background and used to trace. Um, you know, Dave Gibbons, the, the artist of Watchmen, does the same thing on Clip Studio. Um, Michelangelo probably would have. I, I think what's, you know, there's AI being used to do color flats on Clip Studio automatically. Um, these things are going to be used as tools. And I think a cool way to think about it is not like, oh no, is this gonna be replacing me? But it's like, how can I use this to make good comics in a way that allows me also to like sleep and maybe like um, not destroy my wrist or like, are there ways that this technology can supplement some of our own abilities? And, and I don't know how that's gonna happen, but I'm pretty positive it's gonna happen. And probably not in the way we expect right now. Um, AI has certainly been used a lot by audiobook entrepreneurs, uh, like self-published Kindle authors, using its ability to quickly make an audiobook in multiple languages, things like that. And it's not as good as hiring people, um, but you know, even programmers are programming themselves out of jobs right now. So we we we, we will figure it out. Um, and in the short term, yeah, keep an eye on it and and uh, try to be more excited than scared. Um, because, uh, because there's no other option, I think, uh, Jeannie can't be put back in the bottle. Um, also I'm going to just in the chat, put my website and Instagram. If anyone wants to check out the free comic I have, and I don't know, if Shauna wants to put her stuff in there, you know, it'd be cool to see your website. Um, yeah. Nice to meet you in person, Leah. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So we have one more question. And the last question is from Josh. Hey, yeah, I was just wondering uh, what you guys have been doing to uh, get your book out to uh, a larger audience uh, than you're just kind of your inner circle uh, and what you have found most effective uh, and and uh, I guess just basically just kind of getting people to find your book. Um, well, me personally, I've been going to like conventions again to um, advertise my book coming out and, and selling it. Um, I recently sold it at um, FlameCon about um, two weeks ago, and uh, it went really well. So um, I'm going to do that again at SBX this month um, in um, Bethsaida, and I'll also be doing a workshop there um, and social media and stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, Shauna, maybe you could mention that didn't you you posted a picture of yourself in Barnes and Noble? Oh yeah, the book, and, and it kind of went viral. Can you yeah, talk about that? Um, yeah. So um, I, when my book came out, um, I had to go to my Barnes and Nobles and see it in person because it's, it's always like really exciting to like see like your art like in a store. It's like, oh, wow. Um, so I took a picture with my book and I posted it on Twitter and it's like my first viral post. I think I got like a hundred like thousand likes on it. It was just like going to like everywhere and um which was really exciting because a lot of librarians and parents saw it like just a lot of people like I don't know why this is on my Twitter timeline but okay um and so a lot of people were like hey I bought your book as I saw this Twitter post and hey my kids really like it and my kid hates reading so that was like really exciting to like get that immediate um feedback on it and stuff I feel like it kind of goes to what you were saying Daniel about um just being super genuine about your enthusiasm. I, I don't know why, Shauna, that particular photo resonated so much, but I think it's partly just because you were just so, it was so heartfelt, like your, your super excitement of being in Barnes and Noble and holding up and showing your book. And so, I don't know, do, if you have, do you have any other hunches about why it, why it was so popular? I really don't know. I just feel like the right people like retweeted it. And I guess since it was getting like so many um like impressions that um like the thing that Twitter does now is if something has like a lot of impressions, like they'll just like have it pop up onto like as a recommended tweet to like look at. So I think that's what happened with my post. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Daniel. Uh, one thing, uh, I did, uh, is just contact all the comic shops I've ever visited basically, which is a lot because I lived in a van and traveled the country. Um, and contacting local comic shops is, is a good way to do it. They will give your book a chance often. And if not, they'll, they'll tell you on the phone, you know? Um, but that is again, to take this back to consistently paying attention to stuff and, and bothering people. Um, so if you are going to try to get your book uh, in comic shops, most comic shops still use a distributor called Diamond. That distributor is frustrating to a lot of people, including most comic shops, but they often still only use Diamond, um, depending, a uh, little less so. But point being, if you want them to order from Diamond, they need to know they want to order it three months before your book comes out. So like not not two and a half months, you know, it has to be exactly three months before final order cutoff, or they will not do it. So I found this out like right then. Um, and then I had a lot of people order a little late. And because of that, they sold out like that distributor sold out of my book, not that many books, you know, because, you know, a couple hundred or whatever, but at comic shops, those couple hundred can turn into thousands, if people like the book like that's the spot where your book gets a chance to strangers you know so uh that means you also need to pay attention to whether or not your book is on request and in stock because i i went to a few conventions 
I went to, and at one of them, one of the people I'd reach out to was like, oh, I love the book. We sold out the first week and we couldn't get any more. I was like, okay, let's see what we can figure out. So I'm in the process of trying to months later get Diamond to have more books again because there are people that want them and pride and more primarily order through this spot. So um, I know that's uh, more information than you signed up for, but it is unfortunately extremely important. Um, despite only being a few thousand shops, the, the direct market comics is still pretty important for new creators. So uh, pay attention to that three month deadline, uh, pay attention to your local shop will be able to tell you whether it is in stock or not. And Diamond won't necessarily even tell your publisher when they run out. You might have to email your publisher and be like, hey, send more books to these people. And then you can re-email or recall those shops, tell them it's back in stock, hopefully. Or if not, find out preferred method your, your publisher deals with and see if you can convince uh, someone to do that, which you might not be able to. So that that's that's one, one rubber on road thing. Um, yeah. I also did get to do a bunch of stuff with my dad, right? Leo mentioned my dad. He does. This is one of his kids' books. Uh, and uh, I went out, you know, I got to spend time with my parents. Uh, we did, we were on like local access cable channel 69 News, Berks County on Father's Day and just did like a little hometown thing and went to ALA Librarian Convention, which was super fun. Uh, got to meet a bunch of amazing authors including all right, I got some books uh I got to meet Nathan Hale of Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales also Jonathan Case out there lots of great creators I recommend ALA I met so many librarians and those people oh yeah I I have to second that I think investing in going to the ALA conference is such a good idea and just kind of going to every like happy hour and um, networking event and then walking the floors and just seeing who you run into because it's it's an audience that is sort of like comic book shops and that they can kind of help hand sell your book to people. Um, so I totally agree. And again, uh, pro tip, you can by uh, donating art, apply to get a free uh, pass to ALA. And then, so for example, my publisher did not send me to LA, LA. I applied independently, got a free ticket, was like, hey, I will be there. Would you like to have me sign books? And they said, yes, we will get you 50 books to sign and give away, you know, because ALA is not a place you necessarily sell a lot of books. You give them to librarians in hopes they'll buy a couple hundred for their branch or whatever. Um, but yeah, I had a lovely time. It was a super great experience. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and just to buttress what you just said, um, when I went to ALA with one of my clients in June, um, her publisher did not have anything to do with it. We did it all on our own. Um, and then we told the publisher, hey, we're going to be there. And then they're like, oh, okay, yay. <laughs> I, I did a similar thing with Comic-Con, actually. I knew that my book would be at Comic-Con and I didn't even know if Comic-Con was happening. So I just booked an Airbnb that was refundable like seven months in advance. And then I was like, I'm, once I knew Comic-Con was happening and that they would be featuring my book and anyway, what featuring means it's just on a table with a bunch of other books. I was like, I will be at Comic-Con. Could you get me a ticket? And they're like, email me back. And again, just like pleasant, consistent, not bothersome, but like every, you know, month, two weeks, whatever, just, and then they saw me get to ALA. They saw me give a good impression. Um, I, I made them look good, I think. And um, I was <laughs> reasonable to deal with, took care of myself. And yeah, and they got me and my girlfriend tickets to Comic-Con, which was a great experience. Uh, other pro tip, um, be nice to people that don't seem like they're in the publishing industry because either they will be because comics is small or maybe they actually are. Like uh, I, I met two editors at two different book publishers that were like taking photos of people with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cutouts or like, working the register at a booth you know like it's all hands on decks in a lot of situations I mean be be nice because you should be nice but also also <laughs> know that like the people around you you don't know what their position is and don't assume like sometimes they could uh if you have a specific question like I was curious about writing comics without drawing them like as a balance to also writing and drawing my own comics like you might run into someone that can answer some questions 
Yeah, Sean, I feel like you sort of said something similar to me about your experience at San Diego Comic Con, even though Scholastic did like it was planned up front and, you know, they sent you there and it was all expenses paid and everything. I feel like you still put a ton of energy into just kind of showing the Scholastic team that you are good at, you know, promoting your book and just helping Scholastic overall. Can you say a little bit about what was going through your mind as you were at the show? Yeah. So um, basically uh, I went to San Diego Comic-Con. Um, I was on, I think like three different panels and I also had um, my signing at their booth for Mimi. And so, yeah, I was just nice to like everybody that was there you know every time I walked by the booth you know I just kind of like it was just really friendly it's like oh wow look at this book and I'm like oh yeah it's our new book I'm like hey I drew it you know just <laughs> to get some <laughs> and so um yeah people at the register like they were like super super like sweet and just you know buying my books to sign and give to like each other because um my book just came out like that week so it's not like I had like a ton of people to like know about it yet, but even so like they did an amazing job just like attracting people to come. So I did like have a bit of a line, which was like really surprising for me. And um, yeah, just being like really friendly and entertaining like during the panels and just staying like high energy and, you know, going to like the graphics um, after party and the kit lit after party and, you know, trying to make friends and stuff, which is really hard because I get like super, super shy once I'm off the con floor. But um, yeah, and just telling them like everything good that was happening just so that they know like, hey, like, I know my book just came out, but people are lying are like really, really excited and you should remember that because I want to do more books. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, even if it doesn't come easily to you, you have to kind of toot your own horn a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. I think it's easier at conventions because everybody is just kind of like just high off of everyone else's like excitement for comics and everything. Uh, I have a little thought, which is just like if you are I, I'm not someone that has trouble tooting my own horn, but, and yet I do at certain moments in my life. And if, if you're in that moment where it just feels really hard to do that, like don't toot your horn, toot the book's horn, you know, right? Yeah. And if you are having trouble feeling positive about the book, which so many cartoonists do, the closer it is to completion, like the moment I finish, I, I have a lot of negative feelings and they usually go away. Um, and the longer I've been away from it, the more excited I am to read it. And I know that about myself. So if I'm at a spot where, you know, usually right when you're done, you have to sell it the most. So instead of focusing on telling people how great it is, you can just describe it. And if you describe it accurately and those people think that's great, that's their choice. And, and they will, and they will love it. That is that is who it is for. So if you can't feel optimistic in this moment, just describe it. And that is OK. Mm -hmm. OK, well, this was a fantastic, fantastic panel interview, book lunch discussion. So thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Daniel. If everybody could unmute yourself to say thank you. And also, if you don't have a copy of Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe and Cloud Town, Please go out and maybe support your local comic shop or independent bookstore and buy a copy. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This has been terrific. All right. Bye, everybody. Care. <laughs>